So just as a quick review, we, we talked about supervised um, learning. And supervised learning is where you have labels that you want to predict. That's, that's all it means. Um, it's, it's sort of a confusing term for that. But it, it means that you have labels that you want to predict. And the opposite of this is unsupervised learning. And this is, um, I find this to be a much more interesting area of machine learning, to be honest. Because unsupervised learning is much more, um, much more open-ended. There's not a single problem you're trying to solve. There's different classes of problems you're trying to solve. And it's a way to explore your data and get to know your data before making decisions about how you're going, going to use it. And so unsupervised learning is where you don't have any data labels that you want to predict. You just want to see what the data says about itself, basically. And uh, a few examples of uh, unsupervised learning are uh, dimensionality reduction. Let's say you have 4,000 dimensional data and you want to visualize it in two dimensions. What are the best two dimensions to look at? You have things like clustering. So for example, let's say you have a, a million data points and you want to figure out which ones are like the other ones without any reference to a label that you have. Uh, another one is density estimation. So if you want to know which parts of your parameter space are more densely populated, you know, what, what's, the most, what's the most popular value that you see in your, in your data set. Um, so these are the types of things that are done with, with unsupervised learning. And, um, Scikit-learn has the, the, the same algorithm or the same API that we saw above is used for unsupervised learning in Scikit-learn. So for example, let's, we can do here a dimensionality reduction task called principal component analysis. Um, what we're going to do with this is we're going to take the iris data and we're going to ask for the PCA to return uh, a, a reduced data set that contains 95% of the important variance or important information in the data set. So we, we ask for the PCA estimator. We create the estimator. We, we instantiate the estimator. We call fit on the X. And this is the important distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we, we put the Y there after the X. Supervised learning needs to know about these labels, these Y values. But unsupervised learning doesn't need to know about labels. It just knows about the, the data itself, the unlabeled data. And so when we run this, we, then we can run the transform method on X, and we get this reduced data set that's um, 150 by 2. So we've changed the data set to be um, two-dimensional instead of four-dimensional. And if we look at this data set, we look at the, um, the projection. We can see that um, without, without, even, without any reference to the labels in the data, uh, the interesting thing here is that the PCA found a projection of the data that's actually quite useful in distinguishing between the different, uh, different species. Compared to that plot we did before where there was a lot of mixing between them, the PCA essentially found, automatically found a projection that, um, that's useful for separating the species. This isn't always the case, but it, it shows that, um, that PCA is doing something that, that can be useful. Yeah, question? Can you go back to the uh, figures? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So is it dividing them equally into the three equal clusters, or would it just, if it has, you know, oh. the red looks like it's smaller, maybe, or maybe it's four clusters together. Yeah, so. It, have like three, I think, like clusters, really, but you can tell, like, this is only three over here, this one's only at 10, and this yeah. one's like another 20 over here. So I plotted, I plotted the colors on the clusters there, but really PCA doesn't know anything about the colors. So this is essentially what PCA sees. It's just. Okay. It's just taking the data without reference to the labels and um, finding a projection. But then when we, yeah, so, but when, when we go in afterwards and we, we apply the colors that we know from the training data, that, that gives us more of an intuition into what, what the result is. So there's, we haven't done any clustering here. These colors are just the inputs that we, yeah, yeah. We'll get to clustering in a second. Yeah, sometimes. So, so 
dimensionality reduction can be a really useful pre-processing step before you run a supervised learning algorithm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can you can use it as a pre-processing step, and this is especially important. Some some algorithms, for example, don't scale well when you have very high-dimensional data. So you can use a PCA to pre-process and and um, reduce the dimensionality, and then you have a much faster algorithm in the end. So. Um, so that's, that's dimensionality reduction. We've gone from four dimensions here to two dimensions. And you can think about it as sort of a rotation. You, you rotate the data in the four-dimensional space until you find a projection that works for you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I, I mentioned that, I'm just going to repeat what he said. Uh, I mentioned that these, these two components reflect 95% of the variance in the data. And it's absolutely possible that that, that last 5% of the variance could be something really important for your classification. So that's something to be aware of. You are throwing away data when you're, when you're doing uh, dimensionality reduction. But sometimes it's worth throwing away a little bit of data depending on your, depending on your application. So let's move on to something that's a little, maybe a little bit more intuitive, which is uh, clustering. So clustering is something, as I said, that will um, decide which points are most like each other without any reference to the labels in the beginning. And, and the clustering API looks very similar. We, here we're going to use a k-means clustering algorithm, which is a, a nice, fast, easy to interpret algorithm that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, talk about in detail in a little bit. So we start by importing it. We instantiate the model. We decide how many clusters we want. I'm going to fix the random state just so we, have the, so we get the same results every time. Um, we fit it to the data. And again, this is uh, unsupervised, so there's no y in there. It's just the data x. And then here, we're going to do something that's a little bit magic. We're going to predict the values of the x. We want to predict the labels of the x even though our algorithm has not seen the, the y values anywhere. And when we scatter plot that, we see this result. So I'm plotting these on the PCA axes. So these are the labels that k-means decided when we said we want to divide our points into, we want to divide our points into three groups. Um, it found, it distinguished this one by itself and then split these two kind of in, a, kind of in half. So comparing to our other, our other axis up here, you see that the k-means isn't exactly accurate in, the, in recovering the original labels, but it does something that's, that's getting close. And part of the reason we've done this, part of the reason this is an issue is that we've, um, oh wait, sorry. Yeah, so, so k-means basically doesn't have enough information here in this, in this case to, to actually get the original labels. But it does, you can see how the clustering works. It does um, pull out this distinct cluster, and it does pull out kind of these two distinct clusters here. Yeah. So same question, right? Yeah. So, so we get different numbers, so you have mm. for all the three different clusters, you clustered three, is it going to be yeah. the full number? Yeah, so if we had, say, 1,000 points here, but only 10 over there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, K-means would actually be able to do that, would be able to handle that pretty well. Um, there are other clustering algorithms that don't handle unbalanced clusters as well. Um, and so it just de depends on the algorithm. And if you're, if you're really interested in um, the different clustering algorithms that are available, if you search scikit-learn clustering, um, the documentation right there actually shows a, a nice Nice comparison between all these different clustering algorithms that are available and how they perform on various kind of, kind of contrived data sets. Um, so that, that'll give you an idea of, uh, of, of what to expect for the type of data that you're looking at. And there's more, more discussion of, of these 
these clustering algorithms and how you might use them there. One of the things I, sh I hadn't mentioned is that the scikit-learn documentation is pretty extensive and um, pretty user-friendly in my experience. So um, often if, actually I found often if I'm, if I'm searching just generally for information on a machine learning algorithm, the scikit-learn documentation will come up as the first, first choice, or maybe the second choice after Wikipedia. what the, the clustering uh, labels mean? Yeah. Yeah, so it depends. The, the intuition on what the clusters mean depends on the algorithm. In, in the case of k-means, um, what the clusters are is they're, they're minimizing. The clusters are chosen such that the distance to the middle of the cluster for each point is minimized across all possible cluster locations. So um, you can, uh, we'll, we'll talk a, a little more in detail about, about clustering in a, in a little bit. So right now I just want to recap real quick scikit-learn's estimator interface. In all estimators you have this model.fit where you apply it to the data. Supervised estimators you have a predict, maybe a probabilistic prediction, um, and you have a score which will tell you how well your model is fitting on your data. Um, unsupervised estimators, you have a predict for clustering algorithms. You have a transform for things like dimensionality reduction algorithms that transform the data. And there are things like fit transform, which will do the fit, uh, fit method and the transform method all, all at once. Sometimes fit transform is more efficient than calling fit followed by transform. So this is just basically all of this right here. I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of, of the kinds of problems and the kinds of issues that machine learning entails, and, but also really emphasize this um, scikit-learn estimator interface so that you can start, you can start in importing these algorithms and, and think about how to apply it to your own data sets. Well, the, so the question was, can you use uh, machine learning for streaming data where you don't have all of it at once? And um, the answer is yes, you can. Um, there, Scikit-Learn has um, some estimators have this method called partial fit, where you can basically take the next batch of data you have and call it to partial fit, and it'll update the model. And you can call partial fit as many times as you want with as many new data points as you want, and then eventually. Um, in that, the, any visualizations you do, well, you'll have to do manually. Okay. And um, there are some interesting uh, examples of using bokeh, for example, for streaming data where you're updating a scikit-learn model and then visualizing it in real time. Um, but that's something you, you kind of have to build yourself. Oh, for for visualization, um, that's it. If you if you want to do simple visualization, you know, I that's a good question. I think uh, you'd get different answers depending on who you ask. I I tend to use Matplotlib um, for just about everything, but that's probably because I'm old school and I've been doing this for a while. Um, but but I'm I'm really really impressed with what's going on with Bokeh and I, I first checked out Bokeh about two years ago and it didn't seem like it was quite mature enough but these days it's starting to seem like the the tool that um, should be used especially since you can do all these streaming things and you can do these live updates and you can publish to the web and that's something you just can't do with Matplotlib so I'm I'm seeing people at at UW uh, work more and more in Bokeh instead of uh, Matplotlib. So the last thing I wanted to leave you with here before we dive into some of the details of some of these uh, algorithms is this machine learning flow chart. And this is, this is kind of a funny thing. It was, um, it was actually done as a little, as almost a joke by um, Andy Mueller, who's one of the main core developers of scikit-learn. 
um, he put this together and he, you know, he just thought it was this funny thing and then all of a sudden it got like 50,000 retweets or something like that and it, it just shows up all over the web and now every single machine learning library that's out there has a flow chart, something like this, showing, them how to, showing you how to use things. But it, it gives you a good idea of, of where to start if you want to think about, given a particular data set, which algorithm should I use. And now that you know about dimensionality reduction and clustering and classification and regression, you can put some of these things in, context, in context and think about how to use the scikit-learn estimators to start exploring your data and start using them. And if you're interested in where this is coming from, it's just in, um, it's on the scikit-learn website. And actually, if you, if you search scikit-learn um, flowchart, I think it's like the first image, first hit that's up there and do image search. Yeah, so you'll, you'll find multiple copies of it online and all the different uh, derivative works that people have done on this. So um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the basics, of, uh, basics of machine learning and the scikit-learn API. And from here, um, if, you, if you really want to dig into using machine learning on your own data, I think the, the next most important thing to do well, number one is to, to learn about validation and cross-validation, which I'm not going to have time to cover today. But the next important thing to do, I think, is to um, start developing an intuition for how some of these machine learning models work. Um, and once you, once you develop that intuition, that helps you th to think about whether, for example, I should, uh, I should use a support vector machine or a random forest for a given data set. And so from here, what I'd like to do is move into a, a couple uh, little short notebooks where I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into how support vector machines work, how how random forests work, how PCA works, and how k-means works. And I think we have about 40 minutes, so I, I should be able to spend about 10 minutes on each of these and um, and run through this. Sound good? Yeah. All right. So let's let's take a look at at SVM. So. Let's look in depth at support vector machines. So support vector machines are, are a really interesting algorithm that, that are very powerful. And, um, and these, along with random forests, I would say are probably the, most, the two most important or are two most often used estimators in, um, in practice, in, in real, real pipelines. And I'll start by um, clearing all the outputs so I, I can run this as we go along. So first, let's, let's think about motivating support vector machines. So for example, let's say you have this data set right here. And we looked at something very similar to this in the beginning. Um, and you want to draw a line that separates the, um, the yellow points from the pink points. Um, how, how might you draw that line if you were just going to do this by hand? You, you know, this, this seems pretty obvious right here, right? We could, we could draw a line. We could actually draw any number of lines that go and, and perfectly separate this data right here. Now the question is, the, if, if you're writing an algorithm that's going to do this automatically, you need to figure out how you're going to choose between those three possible separations, right? Which, which, one, of these, which one of these do you think is the best, just, uh, just looking at it? The middle one, yeah, it's, you know, it's maybe like a Goldilocks thing. You, the middle one is the best. Now, why, like quantitatively, why would you say that the middle one is better than the other two? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you want, you want, he said you want as much space between the data points on each side. So maybe one way of thinking about it is if you choose this line right here, and let's say this point has a little noise in it, it could easily bump that point over to the wrong side of the line. But if you have a lot of space between, between your lines, then, um, then you're, you're less likely to have that noise affect you like that. So this is kind of the motivation behind support vector machines. Support vector machines have this concept of a margin. And the margin um, roughly is the, the distance from your line to the nearest point. And you can see that that middle line has a much wider margin than the other two lines. And that's why support vector machines chooses that middle line as, a, as the best separator. 
And what, if you uh, kind of squint at this and, and think about it, you'll see that what's interesting about this then is that the, the actual dividing line is really, really driven by the points that are right near the middle, by maybe these few yellow points and these few pink points. But it doesn't really care about what's going on on the outside. So these, if you, if you move around these points on the outside, it's not going to change the model at all. But if you move around these points on the inside, it's really going to change the model because it depends on that margin distance. And so I've, I've heard uh, support vector machines being, the, being uh, kind of an, an analogy of using a median rather than a mean. It doesn't really respond to things way on the outside. It just responds to things towards the middle where, you're, where you really care about stuff. So um, in scikit-learn, the support vector machine is uh, in this SVC classifier, support vector classifier. We instantiate it, and we fit it to our data. And it's, uh, it's super easy like that. And um, once we do that, we can do things like uh, plot the decision function. So I, I created this somewhat complicated routine that all it does is it plots the line and it plots these, uh, these margins that go along with the support vector machine. So we can see where the SVC decides to draw the line. And it's actually the line that maximizes that margin there. Now, um, you'll notice if, if we plot these uh, inside the classifier, it has these support vectors that were fit. And if we plot those support vectors, it actually tells us what they are. So these are the points that are important. We can move any, any point in this plot. We can move away from the line, except for these three, and the fit won't change at all. It'll just be those three, unless they stray into the margins, and that will change things. Um, so if you haven't seen this, IPython has this nice uh, interact functionality that lets you do things a little interactively. So just to give an intuition for how these support vectors change the fit as you add more points. You can see that as you add points on the outside, it doesn't affect things. But as soon as you get a new point somewhere within the margin, it'll, it'll change that margin. And it'll change the model. So this is one of the things that's really powerful about support vector machines is it's not overly sensitive to, uh, to extreme points, unless those extreme points happen to, happen to go across the margin. So that, that's an intuition for what's going on, but, but you might immediately see a problem. Um, you know, if you want to fit a support vector machine to data that looks like this, you're, you're not going to be able to draw a line that separates that data, right? So the classic support vector machine is only a, uh, a linear model. It can only do linear separations. So when you have, when you have data that has nonlinear separations like this, you, you have to think about some, how to do something a little bit more, more compli complicated or intricate. And one thing you can do to do this in this situation is you can do a transformation of the data. So here we can, we can construct a transformation of the data that will let us draw a single line through the data and separate it out perfectly. So imagine if we, if we add a dimension to this data. And what the dimension is is the distance from the origin, the distance from 0, 0. Then all the yellow points will be really close to the origin. All the pink points will be really far from the origin. And we end up with a data set that's linearly separable. So let, let's compute that right here. We can get, we can get this. This is the distance for, of each point to the origin. We're going to exponentiate it just to, to weight it in that manner. And if we plot this in 3D, you can see that we, we now have this nice, um, here, here's our original data set, right? And we've added this third dimension that actually separates out the, the yellow and the pink data. So this is the idea of applying a kernel to your data. You basically take your low dimensional data, you project it into, into a higher dimensional space where things, where separations between the points are a little more simple. Um, and the problem is that uh, in this case, we had to construct our kernel by hand and, and, and look at the data and figure out the exact kernel to construct. Um, another way you can do it is you can just say, well, I don't know where the best center is, but let's just use every single point here as a, as a center. 
So we'll compute the distance from this point of every other point. We'll compute the distance from here, the distance from here, the distance from here. And we end up with a, with a thousand, if these are a thousand points right here, we end up with a thousand dimensional data set that we can then hopefully draw a line through that will separate our data. And that's the idea behind doing a kernel, kernel transformation of, of this data. Now you might worry that um, we're now blowing up our data, right? We're, we're taking our 1,000 by 2 data and turning it into 1,000 by 1,000. And how does that scale as you go to, as you go to higher numbers of points? Um, the really magic thing is that you can do this computation without actually computing, without actually computing that 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. There's this thing in, in machine learning called the kernel trick that comes up everywhere. If you, um, if you want to read about like, the, the, the really important things that are going on in machine learning, a lot of them have to do with the kernel trick. And um, when you ask for the, the kernel equals RBF, this means radial basis function kernel in the scikit-learn SVC, it will automatically run that kernel trick, um, uh, compute the optimal kernel, and then give you this result. So we've, we've managed to draw a perfectly round separating line using our support vector machines that gets all the yellow points in the middle and all the pink points on the outside. And all it had to do was, was apply this radial basis function kernel. So again, this, this kernel idea is that you're taking the data, you're projecting it into a higher dimensional space, and then doing a linear cut and then pro projecting that linear cut back to the lower dimensional space where the linear cut becomes nonlinear. It's kind of, it's this magic thing. It still boggles my mind every time I think about it. And you, you look at the math of it and it sort of makes sense, sort of makes sense. And then in the end you get this magic and um, I don't know how anyone ever came up with that. But that, so that, that's the support vector machine. And this is why this kernel method, this kernel trick here is why support vector machines are such a powerful algorithm. Because they can really, um, in, in very complicated data sets, they can find uh, nice divisions in the data. So um, that was my quick foray into, into support vector machines. Any, any questions about that? Yeah. RBF what? Mm -hmm. No, um, so, so the question is can you, can you see behind the scene what's going on with the RBF? It's, it's hard to see what's going on behind the scene because it's happening in this, uh, it's not actually being computed, it's happening in this kernel trick transformed space. Um, but so the best way to, to understand what's going on is just the intuition that you are you're create you're you're defining a radial a new dimension that's a radius centered at every single point in here. So for each each point you get one new dimension. So what kind of accuracy do you get using these algorithms? Uh, the question is what accuracy can you get using these algorithms? It really really depends on the data set. You know, some, some data is really easy and you can get 100% accuracy with a simple algorithm. Some data is really tough and noisy and uh, you may not have enough information even to get 100%. But from your experience, uh, you think uh, because there's a lot of you know, uh, noise in the, in the industry, they are using that and they uh, From your own experience, when you see some real life experience, experiments and real time stuff, what people are doing in real life, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's both. Yeah, it's, I, I must, are we seeing 90% or better? Or are we seeing you know just barely better than a toss of a coin? Really depends on the on the problem. And in in astronomy, we've um, for things like identifying galaxies or distinguishing galaxies and stars, people are are able with these algorithms to get um, you know high 98, 99% accuracy depending on the data set and depending on the exact question you're asking. So, but it's really it's not a you know it's not a magic pill that's going to solve every problem perfectly. So that's that's where it's really important to develop these intuitions and think about think about what the model is doing and whether whether it's even feasible that it could work for the data you have. Yeah. Uh, I, I speak to numbers that you wouldn't be able to have actual separability, and I think that the SVM software would seem to be happy with it. Yeah. Not, 
Yeah, that's a good question. So sometimes, um, sometimes SVM has, uh, if, if these data sets overlapped, you'd end up um, not being able to draw a perfect line. And what SVM has in that case is it has the ability to soften the margin, which um, basically says that you, you give it a little fudge parameter that lets it, um, that lets it, lets it work even if there's not a perfect separation. And this C parameter here is the one that controls the softness of the margin. So if you read more about SVM in like a machine learning textbook, they'll talk about the softness parameter or the C parameter, and this is where you set it in scikit-learn. Yeah. All right, let's, um, let's go back to our index here. And we've talked about support vector machines. The other important algorithm that I think you should know about is random forests. This is another one that's been used really, really successfully in a lot of contexts. Um, and the cool thing about random forest is that it's, it's very intuitive. It's even more intuitive than the SVM, I think. So I'm going to do the same thing I was doing before. I'm going to, I'm going to clear all my outputs so I can run it live. I'm going to toggle my header and toggle my toolbar. Um, OK, so motivating random forest. Uh, what random forests come from are this really simple idea of decision trees. And if you've ever played, I don't know if you ever played like uh, the 20 questions game where you try to, try to guess what someone's thinking about in 20 questions. That's the idea behind a decision tree. You have a bunch of, um, a bunch of questions, yes or no questions that you're asking about the data. And so for example, if you, want to, if you want to figure out what an animal is, you go in the forest and you look at this animal, and you want to classify it. The thing, first thing you might ask is, how big is the animal? Is it greater than one meter or is it less than one meter? And let's say it's less than one meter. Then you say, does the animal have two legs? And you say, no, the animal has four legs. So we follow the no branch. And then we say, does the animal have a tail? And you might say, yes. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden with just these three questions, you already know a lot about the animal. And you've, you've sort of, you've, uh, you've gotten rid of a huge part of the parameter space of what the animal might be just by asking three questions. Um, and so this is the idea behind a decision tree. The, the, the trick with these questions is that um, you, need to make sure, you need to make sure the questions you're asking are useful ones, right? If I make a decision tree where I say, is the animal bigger than one meter? Is the animal bigger than 1.1 meter? Is the animal bigger than 1.2 meter, right? And just keep asking that over and over. You, you don't have very efficient questions. You want to kind of divide the space each time. And so scikit-learn and, and other machine learning uh, libraries have a decision tree classifier built into them. And what the decision tree classifier does is it, it's essentially a, a heuristic or a, or, or a scheme that lets you choose the optimal question to ask at each point in your tree. So for example, we might have data that looks something like this. And if we want to create a decision tree cl classifier, what it would do is um, it starts by asking one question and saying, OK, I'm going to split the data along one axis. Everything above it, I'm going to call it red. Everything below it, I'm going to call it purple. And then the next step, it, um, it splits on a different axis. So the red one is all red, so it doesn't, doesn't need to split anymore. It's done there. So here it takes the bottom one and it splits it vertically. And it says everything to the left is yellow, everything to the right uh, we'll call it turquoise. That's close enough. And then you split again, and you say, you know, everything to the, to the top here is purple. Everything below is blue. And you can see that these, uh, the locations of these splits and the orientation of these splits are important. But the decision tree is able to, um, to make that choice based on the data itself, based on the training data. And what you end up with here is uh, after just five splits, you end up with a pretty good division of the space that lets you classify red versus yellow versus purple versus blue. Now, of course, it isn't perfect, right? Um, and, and in particular, there, there's some problems. Like, for example, it's got this really weird long box right here. So, so if you have a new point that lands right there at the bottom, that would be called purple. And that's clearly like a, a, a silly choice, right? Uh, by eye, we wouldn't call any of these points purple. We'd call them either yellow or blue. And so, so there, there are these features of the decision tree that make it not, not exactly perfect in practice. Um, 
and we can see that here if we, if we visualize the tree and, and we choose a different random seed, you can see there are these weird features in the decision boundaries that come out. So here's, here's one example of, of this decision tree. Here's another example with a slightly tweaked data set. And um, so we'd like a way to get rid of these features and say, you know, we, we don't want to call these points purple. We don't want to call this strip down here purple. We want to figure out how to do that better. And, and the way that people have come up, to, come up with to address that is to basically do this over and over and over. So you take this, if you take this decision tree and you average it with this decision tree, it'll be a little bit better than each individual tree by itself, right? So if we try this over and over, maybe with thousands or hundreds or thousands of decision trees, we might end up with a result that's even better than any of the individual ones. So this is the idea of ensembles of estimators, random forests. So you take, you take a forest of a whole bunch of trees, each of which are slightly different from each other, you average them together, and then you get a result that's better than any of the individual ones by themselves. So here's an example. I've, I've made the data even more mixed just to show this. And here are a bunch of random decision trees that you can compute from it. And as we scroll through, you see that there are some features that are pretty much constant. The upper left corner is always red. The lower left corner is always yellow. So when you average them out, it'll always be that way. But the, the parts in the middle are a little bit, a little bit more uh, up for grabs, right? So when we, when we actually do this in practice, and we take a random forest classifier, and we ask for 100 estimators, we want to average 100 different decision trees, and then call our visualized tree function, this is the result right here. So we, we end up with something that's a pretty reasonable compromise. Um, I'd say if, if you were to go and try to draw by hand what the boundaries are between purple, red, yellow, blue here, you'd get something very similar to what the random forest came up with. So that, that's the, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the one way you could think of it is uh, you could do a majority vote. Like you ask for this portion of the space right here, and you you take all, all 100 trees and have them vote of what color they think it is, and you might, um, you might end up on purple, like we did down here. Yeah. And then the, it also gives you a kind of a probabilistic idea, because you can say, well, if 20% of the trees thought this was, this was blue and 80% thought it was purple, then you have a probabilistic prediction there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you kind of you train it to a certain level where it's not a hundred percent trained, per se, and then you, you do that on a number of different ones with different random seeds, and then you just average those? Is that how it well so the there's a distinction that this decision tree it's pretty easy to get to a hundred percent prediction on the training set itself. Because you just go deep enough and you have enough questions. But if you, ha if you all of a sudden bring in a, another sample that the decision tree hasn't seen before, then it can, it can very quickly um, get it wrong. Um, so, so where the random forest comes in is it basically, so that's an example of overfitting. If you overfit your training data, then it, it'll predict the training data really well, but any new data it um, won't do well on. But the random forest uh, corrects for that a little bit by not letting it overfit the training data. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, but um, if you if you bring in new data that you want to predict that you you don't know the real answer and you want the decision tree to tell you the answer, then that's the case where where overfitting can hurt you. Okay, so decision trees actually, um, or random forest can also be used for the regression problem where we're predicting a continuous variable. And so this is an example of just some toy data that has a, an overall lo long trend and also a, a daily or a, a high frequency periodic trend in it. 
And decision tree or random forest classifiers, random forest regress regressors, I should say, are um, actually flexible enough that they can fit the model that, account, that takes into account all that periodicity. So here, this red line is the, is the random forest model fit to that data. And you can see that um, it, it does, it's, it's a pretty flexible model. It allows you to, it allows you to fit, um, fit very interesting data. Um, so that, that's, that's basically what I wanted to say about random forests, just to give you the intuition that they're based on decision trees and based on averaging the results of a bunch of decision trees in order to do better than each individual tree by itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. She asked if the uh, if this model takes into account the error bars here, and in, in this case, random forest, the default random forest doesn't. Um, in general, if if you're coming from a science background and you're used to dealing with data that has Gaussian errors and and algorithms that handle that, one of the disappointing things is most machine learning algorithms don't handle data errors very well. Errors in the sense of uh, of known Gaussian spread in the measurement. Um, so in, in this case, I, I just put the, er, the error bars on there is to, to sort of guide our eye, but that the forest doesn't take those into account. Is there another question? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so the question is, how, how would this stack up against a time series analysis? In this case, I think um, a, a time series analysis would be a better way to approach this particular data, especially if you have some uh, prior information know, about knowing that it should have some periodic signals and things like that. Um, but I, I use this example mainly to show just how flexible the algorithm is. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we have uh, about 10 minutes left. Maybe we can take a vote. Do you, do you want to see um, a brief expl explanation of PCA or of k-means? Um, who says PCA? Who says k-means? <laughs> who says GMM? Four people, wow, there's, there's a lot. Let's, uh, I, think, I think PCA won out. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go f go for PCA cuz I think this is a this is a useful one to to wrap your mind around and understand. So, I'm going to again all output clear. So, PCA um, we saw this earlier in the context of dimensionality reduction, right? We we had a large high dimensional data set, we want to reduce it to a low dimensional data set in order to visualize it or in order to compress it for uh, more efficient algorithms later down, later down the pipeline. Um, and basically, to, to understand PCA, the, the best thing to think about is a, a Gaussian blob of data. So um, what PCA does, essentially, is it approximates all data that it sees as a multidimensional Gaussian blob. So here's a two-dimensional two -dimensional Gaussian blob of data. And what PCA does when we, we call, we import the estimator, we call fit, we're going to ask for two, com two components, fit it on the data, look at the explained variance and the components. What PCA does is this, um, these components here actually describe the shape of that ellipse in two dimensions. And I'll plot this up so that you can see. If we look at the, uh, we're looking at the length of the vector and the direction of the vector. So the explained variance gives you the length of the vector. The components gives you the direction of the vector. And we plot that on top of the data, and we see that it's basically fitting this, this nice ellipse that tells us how the data is oriented. Now, how does that help you in terms of dimensionality reduction? Well, um, if, we, if we want to get a one-dimensional representation of this data, the most useful one-dimensional, the most useful single dimension in this data is the one that's along the length with the lo longest variance. So a one-dimensional representation of this data um, 
might look like this. So we've basically taken that, that small variance and compressed it and just used the, used the single variance, uh, the single highest variance as the one-dimensional representation. And you can see that, if, that this gets about as close as you can expect to get to the original data using just that one dimension. These points in the middle are a little farther away, but if you tried to choose any other orientation for the one dimensional representation, you can't do better than this one. So that's, that's all that PCA does. It's just basically fitting an ellipse to data and then squashing the dimensions that don't matter as much. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that this this idea of, of squashing these low variance dimensions is incredibly powerful and it has, has all sorts of applications that um, probably were not anticipated by the, first, the, by the person who first wrote this down. Uh, the other thing I should say about PCA is it's really, uh, it's actually a, an incredibly fast operation. You can implement it in a few lines of, of matrix manipulation and um, even for large data sets there where the matrices scale and, and get too big, there are ways to do iterative approaches to PCA where it's very quick. So that's, that's another nice thing about PCA. Basically, any data set that you have, you can throw PCA at it and see what it, what it does. Uh, tiny quick story. My PhD advisor when I was doing my um, studying astronomy was the, f the first or maybe the second person to apply PCA to astronomy data back in... Uh, I don't know when it was. He, he wrote a really for, um, informative paper in the 90s about applying PCA to spectral data. So I quickly learned that any time I had a data set and I was going to go into a meeting with him, the first question he would ask is, did you apply PCA? So, and so I've been kind of like subliminally trained to, uh, to use PCA on every data set I ever encounter, first thing. And it, it actually is useful. So, Let's take a look at PCA applied to uh, some other data sets. Um, I'm going to skip through this code right here. We saw the digits data set before, and we saw the isomap projection of the data sets. This is what happens if you apply PCA to the digits data set, and you compress those 64 dimensions of all the pixels we're looking at down to two and then plot it up. And this, this, this low dimensional out low dimensional representation lets us um, see some of the relationships between the data, just like the isomap did earlier. But there's more to this, um, to this PCA representation here. These, these components here actually have a, a meaning that let you think about how, how the data is built up. So, for example, if you, if you think about just the the pixel-wise basis of the data set. Let's say we look at the first six pixels of this data. There's one up there, 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 one up there. We add them all together, and we get a really poor representation of our original data. So this is a really, this is a really bad six-dimensional representation. If you compress the data by throwing 90% of it away, you don't get a very good, uh, you don't get a very good result. But what, what PCA does is it says, instead of adding just one pixel, pixel by pixel to create this little representation, instead what we're going to do is we're going to generalize this and, and rather than adding a pixel, we're going to add a basis vector. Um, and what the basis vector is, is you can think of it as this like blob the size of the image. And if we do the same thing with the, um, uh-oh, is this going to work? Yeah, if we do the same thing with the PCA components, this is how it builds up this data, component by component. And so these are, these are known as the principal components right here. Um, sorry, these up here are known as the principal components. And when you add them together with the right coefficients, um, even just six of them lets you uh, do a pretty good job of reconstructing the data. So the true value is on the left, and the reconstructed image in six dimensions is on the right. So instead of using that pixel space and just throwing away data, data um, willy-nilly, you can use the PCA space and you throw away the parts of the data that don't matter. And this is the power of PCA. It lets you, lets you compress data in a way that lets you recover something similar to the original data set. Um, 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so the, his question was, how would you apply this to time series where you think there's a similarity between multiple time series? Um, that, that gets tricky because in time series, generally, you don't have the same sampling rate for different ones. Um, if, if you had the same sampling rate for each time series, you could just pass them in as rows of your matrix and compute the PCA. And uh, that, that's, that might actually be fruitful for your problem. But if you don't have the same sampling rate, it gets, it gets a little more tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, like in astronomy, you know, we, we, get, we get observations whenever the telescope happens to be looking at the sky. And that's not always at a, on a regular grid from night to night. So um, in that case, you have to do some more sophisticated modeling to try to bring them. Maybe, maybe you can fit some like broad curves to them and then do the PCA on those on those fits or something like that. Um, Yeah, that's a good question. So you, you could imagine this uh, being used in conjunction with a decision tree where you compute a PCA and then instead of cutting along the pixels, you cut along the PCA components. Um, and there, there have been, people have studied that and I forget the exact name of it. The, the problem is that um, one of the real benefits of decision trees, it's extremely fast because all you're doing is cutting along the data. And as soon as you add that PCA, um, at, at each node, it makes the decision tree really, really slow. Um, so you lose one of the advantages of the decision tree. But um, I, know I've, I know I've seen that in the literature. I just can't remember exactly what the results were. So um, the last thing I want to say is that y you can imagine here using PCA as sort of a data compression. So this is another application of PCA. Um, I'm, I'm plotting this up right here. So this is what it looks like if you take a, a single example and you add all the components in a row. Eventually, you don't have to get all the way up to 64 components before things are, are pretty, pretty high fidelity in their, in their reconstruction. Um, so for example, here's a, a reconstruction of our data set using only 32 components. So we've cut the amount of data here by in half. We have 30, 32 instead of 64 components. And this, this actually preserves 97% of the variance in the data set. So it's, it's another thing that, um, that PCA can be used for, data compression. And, um, so it's, it's a pretty versatile algorithm and, and pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, you could think of that. Though. It's probably the white space that doesn't matter. It's probably, it's, but, it, but it's deeper than that. It's kind of the relationship between all the data points as they, as they exist in the 64-dimensional parameter space. So it, it gets harder and harder to visualize as you go to higher dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what you have in mind there is uh, something called a bagging estimator. And, and bagging means you like take a bag of all your favorite algorithms and, and apply them all to your data. And then you just sort of pick and choose and figure out which combinations of them do the best. So there's actually, um, there's a, in scikit-learn, there's this whole set of meta estimators. And bagging is one of them. It's a, a meta estimator is an estimator of estimators. So you can, you can bring that together. So it's, it's 5 o'clock. We're out of time. Um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more, we have a few more notebooks in this tutorial that um, hopefully you can read through. Um, there are other videos of, of tutorials I've given online that are more like four or six hour ones. So you can search around for that. And I will stick around if you have any questions. And I'd like to thank you so much for coming to PyData at Strata. Um, we appreciate you taking the time. Anything? Oh yeah, thanks thanks to all the speakers today. Um it's it's really good to be a part of a, a group.
that's uh, that's developing these tools and, and sharing all their knowledge.